going to pray for Harry as he brings God's word to us this morning. So Heavenly Father, we pray for Harry. We pray for your anointing upon him. We pray that you will speak through him. Lord, we thank you for his love for you. And we pray that that will just transfer to us this morning. But open our hearts and minds, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks, Mavis. And uh, I'm going to sit down today because it's been a busy week. And uh, it's been an extremely busy week as we've been uh, sort of preparing for the Christmas tree festival. And um, we're sort of getting there, as you can see. Um, we're not there yet, uh, but we are getting there. And um, it's been a strange week, really. Um, I don't know what your week's been like. Um, has your week been strange? And um, I don't know. You might say, my week is always strange. Who has strange weeks every week? Uh, quite a few hands are popping up. But anyway, that's just life, isn't it? Life is strange sometimes. Um, this week um, in schools, and I know a couple of you are involved in schools, um, this week in schools has been anti-bullying week. Um, Anybody heard of Anti-Bullying Week before? A few ones, yeah? And um, it all started on Monday. For the ones that was in school on Monday, you probably had socks on like me. And I don't know how many of you are notice, uh, or notice things, um, but I wonder how many of you have seen my socks this morning and, and nudged somebody and said, have you noticed he's got odd socks on? Was it dark when he got up? Um, <laughs> It was dark when I got up, but that's not the reason. You see, on Thursday, I went into school to do my normal assembly, and I thought, it's anti-bullying week this week. And, um, and I thought, well, on Monday, it was odd socks day. So I said to the children, no, I'm not being done out. I'm going to wear my odd socks today. So I wore a pair of socks. And then I thought to myself, hang on a minute, I've got another pair of socks exactly the same as these. I'm going to wear them on Sunday. So there we go. And I don't know whether they were that way around or that way around. But anyway, they're the same socks as I've got on today. And you might think, what a ridiculous thing. What on earth is he going on about? What's all this odd socks about? Now, I don't know whether you know or whether you were bullied when you went to school. And a number of you probably were. And you were probably bullied for the most ridiculous things. And one of the things you might have been bullied for was probably having odd socks on. And the other kids would like ridicule you and uh, pull you up and start to, you know, bully you about you wearing odd socks. And it might have been that that was the only pair of socks that you had to put on that morning. And that's the situation for some children who go to school. Only pair of socks that they've got available, they put them on, start to get ridiculed. Let's everybody wear some odd socks. And apparently, this was something that was promoted not just in schools, but in the workplace as well. And as I was telling this to Kevin the other day, uh, actually on Thursday when I was in here after I'd been to do the assembly, and he saw that I'd got my weird socks on, and we started to talk about it. I, he mentioned about somebody that was at work who had odd socks on. Um, the boat did get up in the dark of night or the dark of the morning and he didn't realize what he'd done. But you know, we go around today and people have got jeans with rips on. Now, if you'd have worn some clothes with rips on 30 or 40 years ago, again, you would have been ridiculed for that. You know, you would have been really pulled up, you know, you can't afford, can your mum and dad not afford some decent clothes for you, you know, and you would have been really pulled up and that's what it's all about. Um, and that got me thinking about today, and it got me thinking about obstacles and giants, the obstacles and giants that we face in our lives, and we face a lot of them. And also, that's what I, so that's what I want to talk about. I want to talk about obstacles and giants. I also want to talk about power and authority, and I want to talk about Christmas. Now, I know Mavis has prayed for me, so I want to pray for all of us. So let's just pause, let's just pray that the Spirit can move and He can speak to us today. So, Father God, Holy Spirit, we just pray for Your presence today. We pray that, uh, that things will not be an obstacle for us and we will be able to hear what You want to say to us today. So just free our minds from all the giants that are around, all the obstacles in our lives, 
and just speak to us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now, I've said many times um, that at nine o'clock in the evening, I get the remote control, so you all know about that. And the reason Michelle probably gives me the remote control is because there's absolutely nothing on TV. And if I then choose the thing to watch, it's my fault that it's rubbish. <laughs> and it always is, isn't it? I put a film on the other night, absolute garbage after 15 minutes, I have to find another one. And at the end of it, I give her the remote control back. And I said, look, you try and find something that's worth watching because there is so much garbage on. But I don't know whether you've realized, but that the way that films are actually made, um, so they're not all made the same, but some films are made where there's, there's one scene going on and then there's another scene and then there's another scene and you end up with like three or four scenes of things that are happening and everything seems to be going on at once. And then sometimes there's scenes that tell us what went on in the past and there's a scene of what's happening now and you're trying to work out, is this the past or is this now? And, it, and sometimes it's really hard I mean, she'll give you some sort of clue, you know, do it in black and white when it was old or whatever. But, you know, when it's nine and ten o'clock at night and I'm a bit tired, it's, uh, it's not the easiest thing to work out whether we're talking about now or yesterday or 30 years ago. So that's the sort of thing that I've got in my mind for today. I want us to, in one part, look at a scene from one era of our thoughts and then look at another scene of where we are today. So... Power and authority and Christmas are the things that I want to talk about uh, first, if you like. And I also want to talk about these obstacles and giants. So in reverse order, I'm talk going to talk about power and authority first, because I think we need to be reminded. We know the Christian story. I would hope that you know the Christian story when we sort of get to the New Testament and to Jesus' time and all the stuff that happened there. Um, but... I think we need reminding about it because quite often we forget the fundamentals, the very like basics of our faith are the things that we forget sometimes. We try to be sort of theological and to, to try and get above where we are and that's not, I don't think, where we should be. We should be really simple in the things that we're doing and the things that we're talking about because it's not rocket science, it's really simple stuff. And um, so I want to talk about power and authority and I also want to talk about Christmas because let's face it, as we look around, it's getting to look a lot like Christmas. You could all burst into a song there, couldn't you? I can see the trees. Next week, I won't be able to see the wood for the trees or the people for the trees. But next, never mind, we'll get there. Um, the church has altered over the last few days, and it's like the fairies have come in and moved things around, but that's how it is. But when I think about Christmas, it makes me think about God and it makes me think about Jesus. And um, God is the reason for the season. Jesus is the reason for the season. And quite often people forget that. And this year, you know, our theme for the church is for the Christmas tree festival is Narnia. And I'm hoping that during the Christmas tree festival, many people from our community will come in and ask us the question, the simple question, why? Why on earth have you themed the Christmas tree festival on the lion, the witch, and the wardrobe? And the answer is really simple. You know, whatever the question, Jesus is the answer. And Aslan is Jesus. And he dies, and he comes back to life. So it's really, really simple. It doesn't need to be any more difficult or, uh, than that, does it, if, or any more difficult. Uh, but the, it's just simple. It's all about creation, and it's about what we're creating here to tell the story. And, um, you know, proclaim the gospel and use words if you need to. We pro we're proclaiming the gospel in the story of Narnia, and we will use words if we need to, as Francis of Assisi said, but if we don't need to use words, then we won't do, because a picture tells a thousand words, and the pictures that our youth group have painted are in the windows, telling us the whole story of Narnia. Anyway, um, I want to go right back to the beginning of the Bible. This is one scene that we can get our head around. Um, you know, the other week I was saying to Brian, I had a group of, of children together, and I says, do you know what the first book in the Bible is? 
And I know we have a national curriculum, and I would have thought that they would have known, but not one child knew what the first book in the Bible was. It wasn't St. James. Uh, I'm glad to say, because <laughs> I go in there every week, and Kate goes in, and Josiah and stuff, and, and there's all that stuff going on. But they know what the first book of the Bible is, and they know the Christian story. But not every child in our community does. Anyway, first book in the Bible, Genesis 1.26, and we read this. God says, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish of the sea and the birds in the sky, over the livestock and the wild animals, and over all the creatures that move along. You see, what God was doing to Adam and Eve, He was giving them dominion over what He was giving them. So he gave them the Garden of Eden, and then he gave them dominion over it. In other words, he gave them authority, and he gives us authority. And I'll come on to that in a minute. But you need to keep in your minds that Adam and Eve was given the dominion, the king's dominion, over what he gave them, and he gave them authority, authority to rule. And he gave them what I would say is the Great Commission. And, you know, if you say to any Christian, what's the Great Commission? Matthew 28 is what comes to the mind. But there's a first commission in Genesis 1.28 where, where God gives a commission to Adam and Eve. This is the first commission. And it says this, it says, And God blessed them, and God said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth and subdue it, and have dominion over it. So he's given them that dominion, he's given them that authority, but it doesn't take long before it all goes terribly, terribly wrong. You know, a chapter and a half, if you like, in Genesis 3, where we see the fall, where the evil one comes in and he tricks Adam and Eve. Well, he tricks Eve, actually, but we won't go there. But I suppose, you know, you could say that Eve tricks Adam, but she she doesn't really, does she? She just gives what she thinks that he would like. And Adam and Eve give the devil the keys to the kingdom. You know, God has given the keys to the kingdom to them, and they're tricked out of those keys, and they're tricked out of their inheritance. And when we talk about inheritance, you'll know this, in our lives, inheritance is is, is a big thing, isn't it? And you know, the devil comes to steal, which he did, and to kill and destroy. And that's all the devil comes to do. Well, that's a big thing, isn't it? To steal, to kill and destroy. How many people have gambled and lost so much in their lives? I know people that we've we've talked to in ministry that have lost so much because they've gambled it away. But no one has ever lost as much as Adam and Eve when they was cheated out of the keys to the kingdom. And, um, you know, how many, how many parents have had to bail out their children because things have gone wrong in their lives? And we have a Father in heaven who bails out his children, and that's what the Christian story is all about. You know, nobody giving up as much as Adam and Eve did, but still knowing that there's a Father there in heaven who loves us so much that he would give up anything to put things right. And that's the reason for the season that we're about to celebrate. That's the reason that God sent His Son, Jesus Christ, to be with us, to be one of us, to teach us, and to bring us redemption, and to redeem the whole world. Um, And that's it in a nutshell, you know. And He came with a mandate from the Father, and He came with authority from the Father, And that is why I wanted to just remind us of the authority that Jesus comes with. And he comes with this authority. And this is the peculiar bit. He comes as fully man, but he comes also as fully being God as well, doesn't he? And this is the the thing that a lot of people struggle with. And don't come to me to ask me the questions after, because I don't know the answer to this one. You know, there's, there's somebody that knows the answer to this, and hopefully that one day we'll get to meet him and we'll be able to say, how, how was it that you could come fully God and fully man, both at the same time? 
This is, this is faith that we hold, isn't it? We're faith that we know those things are true, but we don't fully understand it. But what I do know is that he came with a mandate and he came with authority. And you might say, what was the mandate? And we read about the mandate in 1 John 3. So if you've got a Bible, when you go on, look at 1 John 3, 8, and it will tell you why Jesus came. Well, this is the mandate he came with. And it says this, it says, the one who does what is sinful is of the devil because the devil has been sinning from the beginning, from Genesis 1, when he tricked Adam and Eve. Then it, then it says the reason that the Son of God appeared was to destroy the devil's work. He came with a very simple task to destroy the devil's work. But at this stage in his life, I believe that he comes with full authority of the Father, but he comes with no power. So God sends Jesus with all the authority of heaven and of earth, but he sends him with no power. This is like going on holiday with your mobile phone, but not with a charger. And you know, policemen have authority. So this is like a policeman coming to search your house because he's got the authority to do that, because he's given by the government the authority to be a policeman. But he comes to search your house without the search warrant. He has not got the power to search your house. He's got the authority, but he's not got the power. And this is what it was like for Jesus. At this stage in his life, he comes with all the authority, but he comes with no power. And you know, he doesn't get that power until he's 30 years old. But you know, when Jesus was 12, we read that he was sat in the temple and he was discussing with other people. You know, from an authoritarian point of view, he was talking, he had the authority. He was displaying the authority, even when he was 12 years old, but he didn't have the power. And he gets his power at 30 years old when he meets his cousin, John the Baptist. And John the Baptist is baptizing people, and John's, Baptist, or John's baptism that he's offering people is a baptism of repentance. And you've probably heard us say that before. Jesus says to John the Baptist, will you baptize me? And there's, there's this discussion that goes on, and Jesus says, will you baptize me? And John says, no, it's you that should be baptizing me. And we leave it there. Because we think, oh, well, what, what's going on? What's actually going on? Yeah, um, John the Baptist would love to be baptized by, by Jesus, but that's not the story. The thing is that the baptism that John the Baptist is offering is the baptism of repentance. Jesus has got nothing to be repentful of. He's never sinned. So why would John the Baptist want to baptize Jesus, but Jesus still wants to be baptized. Now, the reason that John the Baptist wants to be baptized is he knows full well that he's not expecting a baptism of repentance from Jesus. He's expecting a baptism in the Holy Spirit. But at this stage in Jesus' life, Jesus is not able to do that because he's not received the Holy Spirit. Does that make sense? Let me expand a little bit further. You all know the story. Jesus goes into the water. When Jesus comes out of the water, something happens. In an audible voice, it says that the, the heavens was rended open. This is like a breaking open, a ripping open of the heavens. This is no like gentle wind. This is like what happened when um, Jesus dies on the cross and the curtain in the temple is ripped open. It's the same word that's used in the text, rend ripped open. You know, the curtain that separated this part of the church and that part of the church was six inches thick. It would need a lot of power to rip that curtain apart. It says that stones were ripped apart when Jesus died on the cross. And this is the same word that's used in the Bible when the heavens are ripped open and the Holy Spirit comes down and blesses and anoints Jesus Christ. This is when Jesus receives his power not till after he comes out of the water. So when this discussion goes on between Jesus and John the Baptist about who's going to baptize who, Jesus can't do what he's been asked to do at that moment in time because he hasn't got the power. 
But when he's got the power, he comes out, he hears his father's voice. This is the one in whom I'm well pleased. He goes into the wilderness and he, faints, he, he, he faces the obstacles and he also faces the giants. He faces the evil one who tempts him. And we also come across those situations in our lives where we are tempted. These are the giants in our lives. You see, in Matthew 3.11, it says this. This is what John the Baptist was saying. He says, I baptize you with water for repentance, but one who comes after me is the one who is more powerful than I, whose sandals I'm not worthy to carry, and he will baptize with the Holy Spirit, and he will baptize with fire. And this is the same power that Jesus talks about to his disciples. This is the, the, this is the power that comes through the encounter. And Jesus has the encounter when he comes out of the water. Jesus' disciples have the encounter on the day of Pentecost. And I don't know whether you have had the encounter. But when you have the encounter, you will receive the power of the Holy Spirit. But we need to have the encounter. You see, most of us have been baptized in water for repentance. But some of us have not received the power of the Holy Spirit. This is where your power comes from. It comes from the power will come from the Holy Spirit. I just want to jump to um, Matthew 28. This is the Great Commission that you all know. It says, Then the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Strange, isn't it? They see all this stuff going on, but yet people still doubt. Verse 18, Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. He doesn't say baptize by giving the Holy Spirit. He says just go and baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit and teach them to obey everything that I have commanded you. And surely I will be with you always, even to the end of the age. And then if we go to Acts 1, we read this. It says, On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command. Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift that my Father has promised, which you have heard me talk about. This is the gift of the Holy Spirit. This is what we need to remember. So, another scene in that story of the film, I want to just give you three pieces of Scripture that seemingly are not connected to each other. They sound like three random pieces of Scripture. But these were highlighted to me by a colleague. Numbers 13 and 14, Matthew 6 and Psalms 23. So, Numbers 13 and 14... Matthew 6 and Psalms 23. And um, you know, when the, um, when the Israelites was in Egypt, they were promised a promised land, weren't they, by Moses. And um, Moses leads them out of Egypt and he leads them through the wilderness towards the promised land. And they get to a particular place, and if you know your Bible, you'll know what I'm talking about. And... Um, he appoints 12 people, 12 spies, one from each tribe. And he says, you need to go into this land to have a look what it's like. And it's like us here in Thornton looking up towards the promised land of Clayton. Isn't it, Alan? <laughs> yeah. And uh, so he sends these 12 spies and they go up to Clayton. And they have a look around and they go, hey, it's not bad up here. It's that good. Alan lives up here. And they come back, well, ten of them come back, and they say, whoa, it's lovely. And look at these grapes and stuff, you know, it is a land of milk and honey. But you know what? The men are so big. They're like Alan, the giants. They said, there's no way that we are going to be able to take this possession of this place. And they convince all the people that there's no way that they're going to be able to take this land. 
And, um, and the people start to bully Moses. And they become a giant nation of bullies who bully Moses into saying, no, it's not right, we can't go because we've got all these people who are saying that they're full of giants and we'll never overcome them. And then Joshua and Caleb come back and they say, yeah, we, we've been and had a look round and you know what? It's great. Yeah, the men are a bit big, but you know, we've got God on our side. So are we ready? Shall we go now? And this is a difference of perspective that people have. And what I'm saying is, what, who are the giants in your life? Alan's not that big, are you, Alan? He's taller than me, but he's not a giant. Do you know, let's put things into perspective. I think we could, if we wanted, we could move up to Clayton, couldn't we? And go and live up there. Rates might be a bit more. They don't pay any rates up there. It's always snowy. Do you know, I mean, but the fact is that, you know, what are the giants in your life? Sometimes the things that happen to us, we think are bigger than they are. And um, it's not easy. What they were saying is if we go into the promised land that you were promised, it's not going to be easy. It's going to be difficult. And... Um, you know, God didn't say it was going to be easy. Following God is not easy. You know, it's not, yes, it's, there was promised a land of milk and honey, but it wasn't like going on holiday. There was going to have to work for it. It wouldn't be easy. If we want the things that God has promised us, we're going to have to work for them. You know, we want a Christmas tree festival. We want it to be successful. We want to be able to connect with the 3,000 people that will come through the door. But the work's not easy. You know, we've got to work at it if we want it to be successful. You know, I read the other day that there's 1.2 million people unemployed. And you think, wow, that's a lot of people. And then in the next breath, it says there's 1.5 million jobs available. You know, during COVID, lots of people were furloughed and they've never gone back to work. If we want, you know, to prosper in life, if we want to come into the promise that God has given us, we've got to work for it. It's not just going to come on a silver platter. You know, we designed it's part of our DNA to work, but some people don't want to work. Me and Brian went to Aldi's about three weeks ago to pick up some stock or to order some stock for our food pantry, because that's what we've been doing. We've been going to Aldi's, placing an order. Two days later, the guys, you know, run it through the till, bring it, put it in our car. Absolutely fantastic, really easy. Absolutely fantastic people. So I go three weeks ago with an order and said, can I place an order for these goods? And they said, sorry. And I said, what do you mean? And they said, we can't even get our own stuff on the shelves. Just have a look around the shelves. He says, there's big gaps of product on the shelves. And if you're wondering why when you go into the supermarket that there's no product on the shelves, it's because at the warehouse there's not enough people to pick the product. They said we are 40 people short in the warehouse and we can't get anybody to work. I thought, wow. You know, people are saying we're unemployed. And I know there are people that can't work because, you know, they're too ill to work. I'm not talking about those people. I'm talking about, you know, we, I'm talking about the people that can work. You know, we're mandated to work. It's part of our DNA. It's what God designed us to do. And if we want to come into His promises, we're going to have to work for it. Hopefully, those positions have been filled, those 40 jobs in the warehouse, and we will be able to go and order our products this week. But, you know, why don't they want to work? Come into the promise that God has given you. But we're going to have to work for it. Anyway, let me just give you those three Bible texts and then I'll, I'll wrap this up because I thought this would only take about 10 minutes but it's taken a lot longer because God's been talking to me. And um, Andy texted me something this week on, on uh, WhatsApp. He says, you know, he said there's a guy called Eddie Jones and he's the English rugby manager and he has a formula for getting the very best out of his players I didn't even know that Eddie Jones was the manager of, you know, I don't know. I don't do all that sports stuff. Anyway, performance equals potential. Performance equals potential. And I thought, yeah. And then there's a minus sign. Performance equals potential minus interference. And you know where the interference comes from? 
the interference comes from the evil one. It's the old Nick, as you call him in, in Yorkshire. Old Nick gets in and he starts to whisper in your mind. And when, when those spies came back from, from that promised land and they came back and they told Moses and the others, you know, old Nick was getting in saying, oh, those guys are too big. You'll never be able to, you'll never be able to take over that land. It's, they're far too big. You'll have to wander around in the wilderness for another 40 years. Then all you people will have died off, and that's what happens. They had to wait 40 years, so all that generation had like got too old, and a new generation of people that wanted to prosper, and they moved into the promised land. Our next generation, and that's what we build up our church for, the next generation, the youth of our church, the guys that have painted these paintings in our windows. The next generation are the ones I hope will perhaps do better than I have. And that's our hope, isn't it? In Numbers 13, um, Moses sends these people, and uh, let me just read, and, and when they see these giants... They're just bewildered. And, um, but I want to read to you Numbers 14. Because in Numbers 14, it says this. It says, don't rebel against the Lord and don't be afraid of the people in that land. We'll devour them like bread. What do we brew with bread? Who's had toast for the breakfast this morning? We will devour them like bread. Don't rebel against the Lord and don't be afraid of the people in the land. They have no protection, and the Lord is not with them. The Lord is with us. Do not be afraid of them. And then if we jump to Matthew 6, verse 11, what does Jesus teach his disciples? Give us our daily bread. And then if we go to Psalms 23, verse 5, it says, You prepare a table before us in the presence of our enemies. I know this sounded like random verses, but just put all three together. The giants are like bread. Give us our daily bread, and we will devour them in the presence of our enemies. The question is, who are your obstacles? Who are your giants? And who is bigger than your obstacles? And who is bigger than your giant? I just want to share with you one thing that happened to me on holiday. Um... So this is just over a week ago. Uh, we'd been away for just a week and a half. And um, we was in a room with no windows. It was dark. There was no noise. You could sleep, you know, the first night. I normally wake up at 6 o'clock in the morning. I didn't get up till about half past 10. And um, I was just tired anyway. But there was nothing to wake me up. And God didn't wake me up. But a week and a half ago, God started whispering, whispering in my ears some things about what I believe that he wants me to do. And then old Nick starts up, and he says, you know, when you get home, um, you, you've put everything in your safe at home, and you don't know the number for the safe because you've forgotten it. And, I, I'd got, and then all these numbers started spinning around my head, and I, I woke Michelle up, I said, do you know the number for the safe at home? And she says, no, it's one with a key code on. She says, no, I don't know the number. And I says, well, what am I going to do? I put everything in there. I put all my notes for Sunday. I put my iPad in there. I put the church keys in there. And she says, she says I put my car keys in there, church keys in there. I put everything in there. I locked it, went away. Totally forgot the number. No, I hadn't. Anyway, old Nick says, you're going to have a right problem when you go back. And Michelle says, yeah, well, it has an override key, you know, that you can override the code lock with a key, but I put the key in the safe <laughs> for safekeeping. So old Nick says, you know, even, even you think you can get in with a key, but you've put the key in the safe, so there. Anyway, so I start, I get a pad out and I start to write all these numbers down, which I thought it might be. All these random numbers, where did they come from? Come from the evil one. And I thought to myself, who is bigger than this? Who is bigger than this? He was trying to be my obstacle and he was trying to be my giant, but my God is bigger than that. 
And it wouldn't have, if I couldn't get in it when I got home, it wouldn't have been a problem. I would have got a locksmith to open it. So it wasn't a problem. But at that moment in time, at three o'clock in the morning, it seemed like the biggest problem in the world for about five minutes. And then Michelle said, are you all right? And I said, yeah, I'm fine. Because I realized what the truth was. And the truth sets you free. And the truth is that I have a bigger God who's so much bigger than those obstacles we find in our lives. When Kevin said to me on Tuesday, whoa, I don't think we're going to get the tree festival done on time. Old Nick's getting in. And he's saying the obstacles, these are the obstacles. It did not look like this on Tuesday, I tell you. And it won't look like this on Tuesday to come because we'll be so much further on. He does try to put the obstacles in front of us. He does try to mess with our mind. But I've got somebody who's bigger than that. And it's Jesus Christ. And I have a Father in heaven who loves me so much more than anything else in the world. So let's just pray. Father, we, we thank you for being reminded that you are bigger than anything that can possibly happen to us in our lives. Whatever can happen to us, you are bigger than that. And we just thank you for that reassurance, Lord, that we can overcome the obstacles. We can overcome anything in our lives because we've got you on our side. We might have to face the obstacles, we know, but we know that you are there to guide us through those difficult times, to, to fight those giants, to knock the obstacles out of the way. So we thank you, Lord, and we thank you in your Son's name. In Jesus' name we thank you. Amen. Um, one thing